here's Patricia Winrow at the Cable Easel again, bringing you a program of painting and drawing from life. This is part two of a landscape, or rather a seascape, that I began called Setauket Harbor. It's uh, there on the North Shore in our Brookhaven town, and you will find that um, in order to do a scene like this, it is best to go there. Uh, I work from a monitor because it's the best that we can do to bring a scene inside. We, I bring other things inside, like fruits and flowers and people and so on, but scenes are impossible to bring inside, so we bring them in and work from a monitor. Uh, this is a live taping done of the scene. You'll see that the liveness is shown by the presence of human beings and animals and flora and so forth and so on. Uh, and the wind on the water and so on. So you will find, you, you see that working from a monitor, if you have a video camera yourself, you can go out and shoot a scene, bring it back, play it on your VCR, and you will have the landscape brought inside. It's an innovation uh, from, from our part. I don't believe it's being done any, anywhere else, and, but it's, uh, it's something that you might think about wanting to do yourself. Um, there is, um, the first part was the business of laying out all of the the backgrounds, really, the sky, the landmass, the beach in the background, the water in the foreground, and now it's the business of putting in the details. So I think I'll just do that, first of all, by talking about whatever is in the distance has to be just barely whispered, just a mention of a house uh, tucked into the trees, of something lying on the beach, whatever it may be. If you can't see it very well, that's the way you ought to paint it. You have to just paint it with a daub and uh, not very well seen because you can't see it. Um, in other words, if you know that this is a great big house with green shutters and a red door, you don't do, you don't see it. Therefore, you don't put it in. The just the indication, and it's a slight, uh, it's a slight bow to impressionism that we do by doing this. But uh, you have to have some kind of resemblance to the scene that you have chosen. And if the resemblance means that there are little houses and things in the background, then by all means, they should be put in. No matter how minimal they are, they have to be mentioned. As well as, for instance, a small boat here uh, in the water, the white part of which is showing. And then there's maybe another one right behind it, as I see. And then over here, there is a, uh, looks like a clamming, uh, a, a clamming boat, which is, uh, which has not been brought in for the winter because the owner obviously knows that it can take it out there. And it's vis visible only by uh, a few, by black and white and a certain pattern about it. And so that's all you need to do. Uh, if you have to go and strain, then you're putting too much detail in that you, that you can't see. I think that that's one of the things that people must learn about detail in the distance. That if you don't see it well, don't put it in well. Put in just exactly what it is that you're being told out there. The lower part, of course, is the black. And there are no reflections. Well, there may be a reflection or two today, but it's so minimal that I can barely make it out. And here is the uh, all, all that you would really need to do about recording this boat. Of course, the darkness inside of it should probably be paid attention to. And and I see that I, I need to uh, I need to put a part of that upper deck a little bit further out. So if there is a reflection in the water, and I believe that maybe I can make out some from the from the cabin above just minimal. Uh, that's the, uh, the, the angle that you're seeing on the monitor is only because it was shot and the bo boat had turned in the water. Tricks that are played on you when you're out there as a realist painter. Um, so that's all that you would need to do about that boat. Any more detail would be, would be distracting. And now that that's in, that gives the opportunity of putting in the pilings that are in front of it. There are, there are pilings that are closer to us, and, but they are bi dissecting or bisecting the, uh, the boat back there. And you couldn't or you should not have put those in if uh, you hadn't put the boat in first. It's all a question of the thing that I call the plan. You have to have some kind of a plan. And even these, even these pilings have got a dark side to them. Even though they're far away and they're in very small detail, they still have a dark side to them. Uh, there are other pilings that are, you, you know, being, that are showing, shown sticking out of the side of this dock. That's what holds this dock in place. And so those details have to be handled with great care and not too much, not too much detail, but they must be there. So the care that you take means that you have to be selective about the details. And even if one of them is crooked, by all means, put it in crooked. Uh, there is, um, there is a pattern 
to this, which of course you can see on the, uh, on the fact that it's lying down, but the pattern is that, that there are cross pieces uh, in, this, in this ladder that leads to the floating dock. And I explained it the last time that this, that this dock, the composition is helped by having this ladder to the dock uh, at an angle which complements the one of the log in the foreground, and it's only because it's winter time that this that this dock is that this uh, ladder is up. But I've taken the liberty; it's called artistic liberty, of um, putting it in this way <clears throat> to give you some idea of how you can, in fact, help your composition by selecting certain areas. It's it's not exact. It's not cheating. It's called composition. At least that's what painters say it is. And uh, I've done it many times. If it helps the composition, I simply I simply push it over a little bit and put it in. Of course, there's nobody there to question <laughs> your judgment because you're the guy sitting there at that time. Um, the uh, the uh, the details uh, that are indistinguished and you can't make out what they are uh, on this dock more than likely it would be a guess as to what these white things are that are lying on the dock they could be clothing from a fisherman who is out they could be uh, buoys or or the buffers that prevent the boats from banging up against the dock but whatever they are they have to be attended to in some kind of interpretive way so that we know that this is not just an illustration for a child's story. There's some reason for all of these things down here. And it gives also a little bit of texture. I also see that there's something swimming over there, and there's a buoy apparently here, or something white. Uh, it's, it's, it's a great distance, and, I, and I'm not sure that I can make it out, but there are reflections that I'm going to attend to right now by... Um, uh, uh, seeing that they fall direct. Oh, and there's another wonderful angle piece here. I believe that's a boom that is going to be able to take care of some kind of trawler uh, equipment, but it's nevertheless there, and even though it's hard to see, it has to be put in, and because it causes nice reflections below. And so here we have, and then there's this angle, and all of these reflections now start to give a third dimensional quality to this scene. The reflections are in the pale part of the water. This one, of course, is at an angle, therefore you pay attention to the angle of your reflections. It's called uh, ob 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 observing, uh, something which uh, you don't find when you are working from your imagination. Uh, I have another rather large one that bisects the sky here, and that comes right down and hits the dock. It's something to do with the anchoring of the dock, and it's, uh, it's tall enough to go past the landmass. This is called reference points. And then there's another one going past here. So all of these things explain why there's a reflection in the water here. It's these large pilings. Reflections are, of course, well, the painter's dream. We all love to find reflections. That's why when you go to Maine, you find there are painters every four inches in Maine, because Maine is full of water and full of reflections. Uh, they're great fun to do, and they also make for wonderful romantic looks of paintings. These are white things in the water, be they possibly uh, unoccupied buoys or stones. But <clears throat> I'm working towards the business of the foreground. A painting can be made or broken by the foreground. If you don't pay attention to the foreground, you have... Mm, uh, um, completely thrown away the work that was done on the foreground and the middle ground and the background. So detail, the details of the foreground are actually vital to the composition. And if people find paintings um, without foreground, it's because the artist has chickened out. He's decided he can't handle it. Well, the foreground, of course, is going to be done with many different kinds of brushes and it's going to deal with many different kinds of forms. Namely, whatever it is that is there in the in the uh, mud and sand in the foreground has to be uh, attended to with, with care and observation, but I'm not illustrating a book on trash, and so we have to try and understand what it is that we're looking at. Even rocks and something as simple and as uh, unobtrusive as pebbles or flotsam and jetsam on the beach have their own shadows and they have their own form. So you don't fake it. You, you have to recognize the fact that even no matter how lowly these objects are, they've got their own their own style, and their own shape. So if this rock here, which is, may seem formless, 
uh, has got some shape to it, it's only because you're going to put it in and give it its, its shape, its form, and its shadow. Uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, paintings that don't have foreground work um, fail. They must have foreground because that's the closest thing to the viewer. One of the most remarkable paintings in the world ever by an American painter whose name was Frederick Church painted Niagara Falls. Now, there is a show on right now at the National Gallery in Washington with Frederick Church's work, and the Niagara Falls painting has no foreground whatsoever. The only foreground that the Niagara Falls painting has is the water going over the edge of the falls, and you feel as though you are literally standing on the edge of a precipice and that you may just be sucked in by the fascination of that. It is a remarkable piece and so my, my lecture just now on foregrounds is totally shot and, uh, and thrown to the wind by the fact that Frederick Church painted the most remarkable painting in American painting history and had no foreground at all. So here we have, there are always exceptions to the rule and I've just given you one. Uh, if you by any chance do plan within the next few weeks, I'm afraid that show is going to be over soon, to go to, uh, to Washington, to go to the National Gallery and see the, the Frederick Church exhibition, uh, it, is, um, it is an experience that you will never forget if you've never seen these paintings. They're huge and they are done from life. Most of them are done from life. A lot of them are done from from the, in the studio from sketches, but for the most part, they were, most of them are done from life. Um, all right, well, we have the shoreline. There are small objects, um, as you can see when the uh, close-ups are given to you, that the objects are dotted uh, about the shoreline here, and they give, you, um, they give you the information that low tide is here and things have been exposed. The, uh, the need to simplify them, of course, is always present, but the need to remember that they have form, shape, and shadows is uh, not to be forgotten, even though they seem totally insignificant and maybe tiresome to paint, but they're, they're vital at the same time. The, the, the sunken log is a problem because it's so uh, amorphous and it does not have much form and shape to it, but it does have a dark side and it has a light side. The dark side I've done with them, well, some of the Indian red and a touch of black, which I very rarely use. I very rarely use the black, and I've lectured about that because black is a really dead color. But when you're painting something as dead as a sunken log in the mud, then you can, in fact, go to a dead color and probably have it um, easily accepted as a fact that that's a dead piece of wood, therefore it can have a dead color on it. Um, the, uh, the lightness of this log, I'm going to probably unpaint that as time goes by by uh, either scrumbling it, which is a term that painters use when you paint something and then you go back and you take a lot of it out. Um, the, uh, the, need to, uh, the need to scrumble makes the difference between what you would call commercial art and fine art. Uh, it's, it's a difficult thing to explain. It's got to do with focus. It's also got to do with um, uh, the importance of certain objects as opposed to the no importance of other objects. And I don't want this to be a study in a sunken log. I want it to be part of the entire piece, but it has to be attended to. I'm going to uh, just break for a short uh, moment to, um, to let you have a breather, and I'll be right back.
are back again to complete part two of a painting of Setauket Harbor done in the dead of winter. With some activity going on, some rather remarkable shots that were taken when this, uh, when it was, uh, when these, this tape was made. And I'm working towards the business of completing it and having the details um, attended to, which are, of course, many times extremely, uh, extremely confusing for the average painter uh, and for the less than average painter as well. I see that um, there is a little area of pale. Uh, of a sort of reflected pale water in here somewhere uh, because as the um, light changes. As time goes by, there are changes in all things, and uh, particularly in water areas where something that wasn't brilliant before suddenly turns out to be brilliant because the light has changed. So I'm, I'm pulling some of this water over because as time go has gone by on the scene, it is not static. It has changed. And there is, in fact, the introduction of a little bit of, of blue here, which means that the tide may be coming in and the, and the area underfoot is getting wet by the minute and of course being as soon as it gets wetter it becomes uh, a reflection of the sky the sky is reflected immediately and oh there is a um, there is a wonderful presence of other creatures besides me at this particular scene namely uh, a small gull which I'm going to try to before he decides to go away try to put him in here in proportion now this is a small detail and he's um, He's a, uh, it can't be made too big, otherwise he doesn't, he's not a gull, he becomes a pterodactyl. And we don't, we're, try, we're dealing a great deal in proportion. I believe I'm going to put his little reflection in there because I know he had it even though he's gone. Uh, all of these things are to be, um, to be tr kind of remembered on the spur of the moment. Uh, these things come and go rather quickly, but he did have a dark, uh, a dark portion to him because he was in, um, he was lit by the sun. There he is, and the part of his tail is, is uh, dark, and uh, the darkness, of course, would also be in the reflection. So all of these things, and I don't think that his gull or his beak was, was entirely visible. If it is, I'll go back to it later. Um, the, uh, the need to attend to the, the fleeting details that you'll find when you're out in the wild is that you drop whatever you're doing. Rocks are always going to be there. These rocks that I'm doing right now are not going to go anywhere unless the water comes and covers them. But the, um, the uh, creatures are going to be gone uh, fast. So I stop what I'm doing immediately and try and uh, attend to the, um, the moving objects as they are. Um, so uh, I, I see that there's one moving in the distance there, and that apparently is uh, the one that I had before, and it's now decided to move, but I, so I'm not going to worry about it. <clears throat> Maybe just give, it, give him a, a, a neck. And uh, these are things that people find extremely difficult when they're working uh, in detail. Now, there's the remarkable shot that I wanted everybody to make sure they saw. This is something that you don't see very often, and that is one of those large gulls that has, uh, in fact, spied and is worrying and about to go off with a um, with a uh, with an eel that has come up out of the mud. I think that it's a remarkable kind of shot. I mean, Mr. Marty Stauffer with his Wild America would kill to get a shot like that. <clears throat> Especially, now there you go. Now I think that that's a bonus for this program to see to see that event take place in uh, in the dead of winter, uh, right here in our own in our own area. So, uh, not expecting to see that again for a while, I sure hope you caught it, that the, the, there was, in fact, a rather large gull uh, <clears throat> that had found and captured and flown away with, a, um, with an eel that had appeared out of the mud. So, uh, I, he's gone. I have no way of being able to... Um, to record that anymore, that's, that's, the, that's the end of it. But as I, what I remember is that he leaned over and uh, there was, um, was a much larger, and there was something, uh, something that looked like it was, you know, there for him to take, and it's just a question of recording it, and so possibly, hopefully, um, I think that his beak was probably yellow, and that just a little tiny detail. It is of no importance to the picture. The only importance that it has is when you get back, and you tell people this happened. Uh, this is the best that I could catch it. That's the that's the, the the most that you can hope for. 
Well, there is need now to probably attend to, uh, if there is any activity at all in the sky, and if there isn't before we go, I will simply show you how you, uh, let's say, because there are no gulls there now and we're going to be running out of time, the way I do, the way I will portray birds, and I find that most of the time birds in paintings usually from people who are not professionals, are out of proportion. And so if there is activity in the sky and you ha want to show birds, which of course are always part of a seascape, is that you would do them with great care. I'm going to use, um, I'm going to use uh, this brush to lean my hand on. As you can see, I need to, uh, I need to have something to lean on. And I'm using, a, uh, some, I'm, I'm using a rather globby piece of paint, and I'm going to show you just about how, how big it ought to be, and certainly no more than that, uh, because if it's out of proportion, it's just, uh, it's just well, it's amateurish. And so we want to try and keep things uh, in, in, in proportion as best we can. Um, if they don't show that much, that's all to the good, because they didn't show that much when you were out there. It's only when they get near to you that you have to make sure that they're seen. And I just saw one flying by against the water, they, which is, oh, it's landed on the piling. OK. It's, it flew against the water and therefore was much more visible because of the dark background that it had. And if, and if one does land on the piling, then it doesn't have to be any more than just a dot, uh, unexplained and unexplainable. But there are, of course, at all times, tremendous amounts of, of, of activities from birds. And I, don't, I have never attended to this as part of a seascape lesson to show you. So you see, this gull here in the foreground is much bigger than the little ones that I have shown you in the background for purely for proportion. Um, the, uh, the studio here, the, the mock studio that we have uh, here, has got a painting of mine, which I would probably like to talk, to for a, uh, talk about for a minute, because I don't usually do this. And uh, it, this, is, this is done from a sketch, or many sketches, that I did at the Bronx Zoo a long time ago. It's a, um, it's a baboon. Uh, and he's a very small animal, but uh, you can't see him very well. And I did drawings of him and decided that it was time for me to do him in, in oil colors. And so I, and, and I was intrigued with the coloring of the face, the blue and the red and so on. And so I introduced a, a pale blue iris and a bright red tulip next to him and entitled it uh, Beauty and the Beast. So I just thought, in case you had gotten a glimpse of that, uh, <laughs> As you were watching the program, you might have wondered, what is the baboon doing? It's a painting that I did in 1986. I don't expect to ever sell it, but I think it would probably look wonderful in a powder room somewhere. Um, that's, of course, a joke. Somebody someday is going to fall in love with my baboon and decide that he must own it. That's the chance that uh, painters take. They paint something because they're inspired, and then they may have it for 10 or 15 years before anybody decides that that, belong, that they would like to acquire it. Uh, I, my, pay, my, my flower paintings don't have that problem. Most people are seduced by the flower paintings, and they have no problem uh, selling those. But the baboon, is, that's my explanation of the baboon. So uh, for just one moment, let me, uh, uh, there is not much time left. Let me go a little, little bit, go back over how I'm going to handle this. There is a need for me to handle something down in the water here here. Uh, there, well, we do have a few moments go going. The, um, the details in the water here where I had just, so, just kind of dismissed the, um, the, uh, these darker areas in the thing, there is, a, there is um, some detail needed. The water it becomes light in places and gets a sort of an iridescent sheen, which means that you would uh, give this glow and this iridescence down here in what probably is semi-frozen water uh, with, um, with the mud flats underneath causing a, a, different, um, a different elevation to it. So uh, the close-ups that we have can show you a little bit how you would handle that. You can only do this really in oils. Watercolors would not afford you the ability to, um, to blend like this and get what I call a luminous quality about the water. The, um, it's what draws me to water scenes is the luminescence uh, that happens out there in the wild or uh, actually in the, um, in the scene uh, at hand. There is uh, naturally taking a short time to try and 
record this kind of, uh, of a scene is, is understood that it is not possible to do in such a short period of time. There are people who are doing programs whereby uh, paintings are done in a half an hour and those are, well, they are not the kind of paintings that I would consider uh, saleable. They are fine demonstrations of speed and virtuosity, but I don't think that they are paintings that would have um, a painterly quality about them done. So what I'm doing here is merely an, uh, uh, a quick instructional thing, trying to deal with some of the problems at hand of doing paintings uh, out there in the wild and to give some, uh, so some information about how you get the glowing qualities. I do that when I paint flowers and when I paint water drops on flowers and I simply take the, the, the opportunity of the moment to show you how the water drops are done and I'm taking the opportunity here to show you how you would try to get the luminescence of this water. Maybe you could, the, we could introduce some, um, some, uh, a few reflections uh, of the of the whiteness here of whatever it is that's on the dock and a few reflections that would come down like so but very minimal and to be used with great taste uh, somewhere along the line there seems to be some uh, a railing missing along here which uh, I find very difficult to, to see because the um, it's out of the monitor but I do know that logically there is a railing up here that is going to tell us that the uh, that human beings walk along this and that there is a, that there is a, some detail probably some cross pieces as I as the as the railing is supported and maybe down here as well well I tell you um, the uh, the business of going out and painting from life is a, a, a really a vital part of being a painter a realist painter I'm not talking about uh, doing something that comes out of your mind or your memory and that is fine to do but it's not entirely the same kind of thing that I'm trying to instruct. I uh, certainly don't want to sit on anybody's imagination or anybody's visual remembrances of things. However, I work from life. I hope that you got something out of it. I hope that you um, will continue to watch The Cable Easel. We won some prizes, so that means that somebody else is uh, appreciating this besides the audience. They're namely the judges. So uh, tune in whenever you see The Cable Easel advertised. I am live the last Tuesday of every month uh, at 8 o'clock to answer phone calls and questions from you, the audience, who may or may not have some question. Good night and thanks for watching.